Hey, welcome to another Grit Berkman Special Coaches Cafe. It's going to be fun talking today about some of our best practices that we might have come into uh, in the last few weeks, especially talking about how we can uh, pick up some new tips, uh, new tools perhaps to use as we're talking about online team building primarily. So uh, we are recording the session today for those that are not able to join us because of the time or because of other commitments. And we're thankful to have um, a good number of you that are joining us here right now. I hope that you will be joining in the dialogue uh, to share some of your own tips, uh, some new tools that you might be using. Uh, we might even be able to share some screens and to demonstrate that. So uh, let me just say a quick word of prayer, if I might, to get us started, and then we'll jump right into the dialogue. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you give us to use technology like this so we can share with each other all over the world the different ways that you're helping us, Father, to discover new ways to build unity in the body of Christ, and then, Father, to help mobilize the gifts of your body so that we can see more fruit coming to you. So today, I pray that you will uh, help us in our dialogue that we will be encouraging one to another, that we will perhaps discover some new things that we can put into place so that, Father, we can help teams uh, as they are scattered across the world, as they're scattered and perhaps not able to gather physically, but they can gather together in unity through the different media that you provide for us. So help our conversation today, Lord, glorify you in every way so that it can be useful and fruitful for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, right off the bat, let me just say that the last uh, couple of sessions, we did a couple of team building demos, and I see that Neil and Steve, uh, who let out in those, are online with us, and some of you might have some questions for them. Some of you might have some comments that you want to make to us about some other tips that you have uh, uh, come across, and I've got a couple of things I want to share with you. Right off the bat, let me uh, share a screen, and we are having... Um, we do have some resources that are up right now on the Grit Berkman website. If you have not logged in as a coach, you really ought to do that because you're going to see some really neat things that are there. The first thing that comes to my mind is that we um, are offering your leadership grip for $5. That's a pretty good bargain. So it's a really good time for people to join in and do the leadership grip assessment if they've not done that before. And um, it's a good opportunity for you to even introduce it to, to a team, uh, as I think Les Cool likes to refer to it sometimes as the, the gateway drug, I think, to grip Berkman, getting people to first get into your leadership grip. But a lot of our churches have also discovered that using your leadership grip alone can be a great tool. And then later on, we can add the, the Berkman to it if indeed um, we uh, can get them to start talking about how they want to use um, the assessment, looking at their personalities, looking at their behaviors, and how that helps to explain more fully how they work together in team, even if they don't call it team. So uh, it's really um, a great opportunity for you to use your leadership grip and to get that going right now with that good discount that's on it. Also, if you've signed in as a coach, you're going to see that we've been populating the coaches resources page with a number of new things, and we'll be adding more new things all along the way. There are several tools here. Uh, the uh, recordings of the last two team builds that we did online are, gonna, are here now. This session will be there, as well as uh, the link for our monthly Coaches Cafe with all of those. And then some of the tools that we talked about, even uh, the um, uh, PDF in Foxit uh, PDF format that, that Neil used with us a couple of weeks ago, uh, there are some um, tools here talking about um, how you use the mosaic, the gift circle, looking at uh, also the links to discovering your dotted diamond. If you are using Grip Berkman, and we want to be sure that we help people connect the Berkman to your leadership grip, and how do your gifts and your behavior connect? The dotted diamond is that connection. So we're putting up more and more of those kinds of resources that uh, should be helpful to you. Be sure and visit the uh, the web page so that you can take advantage of those and visit there often because we'll be adding new resources as time goes along. 
Uh, and so with that, let me just ask uh, if you have some resources that you'd like to share with us, anything that's come up, any best practices that you've come up, this is a time for you to just jump right in there, open your mic and just uh, let us know who you are and where you are, if you can identify where you are and uh, share whatever that might be. Larry, I'm, I'm going to uh, jump in while other people are thinking and uh, just let everybody know that the uh, the mosaic PDF that you uh, posted on the website is the the newest uh, and latest version of the uh, uh, the whiteboard that I used uh, to discuss leadership grip and uh, I, I did make some modifications uh, after using it several times and talking about it with uh, others and uh, I hope others like it and uh, it's I think definitely work improved and it's worth looking at uh, again if you haven't had a chance to uh, see the uh, uh, the video that we made of it so uh, definitely worth checking out again and then uh, uh, there are two different versions of the uh, the gift circle uh, one of them's just the circle and uh, I think is is really useful for uh, uh, for discussions and then the other one is kind of like an instructional aid so uh, those are available there great thanks Neil we do appreciate that and um, it's a it's another easy way by the way uh, speaking of that I've got a quick tool here that we did also that's similar to that what uh, what we uh, have done with the PowerPoint is say hey you don't necessarily even have to put it in present presenter mode you can enlarge your screen, you can get rid of all the other extra little things around here. And as you put it on your screen, um, you can move symbols around. You can go through a quick little illustration. We're using the Burtman map here. Uh, talk about the four symbols and how there are four symbols, but they actually show up in only three places on the, the map. Then you could even talk about moving the symbols around on the grid. To, on the map to show you how they are how they are placed. You can come and you can uh, move them around that way. But another thing that you can do, we discovered is, hey, you can annotate. So I'm going to just use the text here and put uh, symbols up here. And since I'm sharing it, any of the rest of you that would want to join in right now, I'm gonna put my interests where they are, just right up in the corner there. And anyone else could join and could click on the annotate and you can also add your own symbols, uh, add your own initials, wherever that symbol for, let's say for interest might appear. If anybody wanted to click on your annotate button up there, if you can see that, the annotate should be somewhere, either at the top or the bottom of your screen. And then when you click on it, you can click on um, text and you can add your symbols or you as the coach, could just be adding other people's symbols in there for them if you wanted to. Um, and whoever that might be on the team, there you see somebody's added their star there. Who was that? I added that star, Larry. Hey, there you are. Okay, Neil. We could see how the team is populating here, putting your own symbol or your own initials in. And then we can also save by just clicking on the save button and you're going to see that it will show up. In my case, I'm using a Mac, so it would show up in my um, uh, binder. And I can come down here and I can have a screenshot. So um, lots of different ways that you can use the different tools. The biggest thing is the tool is not the most important piece of this. The tool is just a tool. The most important thing is getting the team into dialogue. So whatever tool you use, be sure that you're familiar with it. Be sure that you can use it uh, with facility. Be sure that you've gone over it several times and that you've gotten all the glitches out of it as you're sharing with them. And then walk them through quickly using the tool. But again, you want to get them to dialogue just as quickly as you possibly can because that's the whole purpose of this team build, getting them to uh, be vulnerable, getting them to share their own uh, insights about their own uh, assessments, but mostly getting them to talk about how they need others. Uh, what do I need from other people and how can you help me? How can I help you? 
Anybody want to uh, make any other comments or have any questions about that? Or perhaps from your own experience, you might even have some uh, specific experience that you'd like to share with us about something that happened related to that. I want to emphasize what you just said. I, the um, Sometimes there are glitches in the tool, uh, using it online, and sometimes it, it doesn't work exactly the way we want it to. But I've uh, been doing uh, several group sessions using uh, both whiteboards, and uh, and, and people have been uh, more than excited about uh, the information that they're able to see. And it does set up the conversation uh, in, a, in a way that uh, they're not usually seeing with, with a Zoom meeting. So uh, even though the technology doesn't work out perfectly every time, they're pretty excited about uh, the conversation that it sets up. Yeah. If you look on your participants, uh, button there that should be at the bottom of your screen or if you're on an iPhone you might have to swipe over to see participants but in your um, when you see for your at the bottom of your participants list there ought to be a yes no a hand raise that sort of thing if you would click on yes I want you to click on yes if you have had a team build with any group in the last four or five weeks. If you've done a team build online since we have been in shutdown with the coronavirus, just click on yes, and we're going to see a quick little poll this way. Neil, I see that you have. Um, some others have clicked no, that they have not. Uh, have any of the rest of you been able to, to come up with any team builds? Have you been able to visit with people online talking about their Grit Berkman assessments in the last three to five weeks? All right, now what I want to do is get you into the dialogue of what's keeping us from doing that. And I'd like for you to share what is keeping us from getting teams together online to do some team building at this particular time. What obstacles are you seeing? And don't be afraid to be vulnerable and share with us, please, because this is a one Grit Berkman community. I'm watching the guys and gals that I've had contact with dealing with two things right now, technology, and they're overwhelmed with life right now. Okay. And they don't see how another conversation is gonna make a difference. That's valid. What else? I think for me, I'm, I'm a rookie in here because I just, just, just trained last year, so, uh, mostly my training is just basically because I'm a senior pastor of a church, I'm using this training to work with my pastoral team and my leadership team and my ministry team. So I'm not up to the point to do a team dynamic at this moment. So I really want to try it, but I think there's a next step. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, Albert. Welcome to the community. Albert, um, I was exactly where you were a couple weeks out from my coaching and a large church invited me in. Just dive in the water. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> and Larry and Jay and the others are a phone call away if you get stuck. They okay. really are. Okay. We are always just a phone call or a Zoom call or an email away. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it's not too hard to get in touch with. It. It's not an obstacle. It's just not time yet. Um, it's people are dealing with other things that are different in their lives even in the work environment. And so the teams are becoming different. So the, the teams I would have built, the groups I would have built teams with two months ago, it's gonna be a different team, different set of people because the task will be different. Good point. So it's not about, about a when, not an if. And, and for example, I mean, shifting from, you know, a church going physical service to online services and, and how you manage that or, I'm shifting from holding classes to I'm, I'm now a center of food pantry. Um, it's a whole different kind of uh, set of work that people are kind of getting to and how they work. So I think it's just a little early for us, but I think it's time, it's time to start planning and thinking. All right, let me, let me try to address a couple of those if I might, because first of all, the very first obstacle that was mentioned was the fact that people are stressed. Uh, is anybody going to say that they haven't encountered um, or that they've encountered anyone who is not feeling any stress at this particular time in, in, in history? 
Uh, I think we're going to be in agreement that we are all experiencing stress. And one of the big things that we talk about is stress behavior. How does that affect our intercommunication and our interrelationship with other people? How does it affect our interdependency in the community when we are all operating under stress and we can observe our stress behaviors? Mm -hmm. And then we come and we say, all right, Grip Berkman specifically talks about how do we help to meet our needs or our expectations so that we can mitigate our stress behavior and maximize our more effective, uh, productive behavior. Can we see people right now that are able to operate in that diamond area of their effective, usual style of behavior? And what is usual even right now? One of the things that I'm seeing in my own church uh, is we, we have this tremendous creativity that has been coming out of our, uh, our entire church body, not just the staff. They have been extremely creative in this. We're also seeing creativity among many of our members in the ways that they are reaching out. And the question that I would raise is, could we not, can we not, as coaches, help people to, to use the knowledge that they have, the self-awareness that they have, the team awareness that they have, in order to say, look, as we are going through this, the things that we have learned from our assessments and from our dialogue with each other are more valuable now than they would be at any other time. So what I would propose is not that we necessarily say, hey, I want to come do a Grip Berkman team build with you but that we could propose, you know what, I've got some things that could help as your team is dealing with these issues that, 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 are, uh, that we are facing right now. So I'm not pushing Grip Berkman, I'm pushing for you as a coach to offer yourself and the tools that you might have to help a team be, move away from paralysis to effective ministry and mobilization, even as we are stuck in our houses for however long shutdowns might last. Is that um, resonating with anybody? Yes, that makes sense. <laughs> well, I don't want it to just make sense, but is it something that we actually can do? Yeah, I think we could do that. I, I need to go back through and make a few phone calls. I, I think that's what I need to do. Um, yeah. Larry, I think someone made a great point about uh, the, the fact that churches are in transition, teams are in transition, and uh, the point that you just made about uh, the opportunity to talk about the way our stress uh, responses relate to the times that we're in is a great uh, way to have a, a short meeting. We, you know, we're not, we might not do an hour or three hour training, but even a half hour transitional uh, related meeting that passes on information is a value added to the uh, the teams and leaders we work with right now. I find myself um, in many of my conversations not referring at all to someone's um, profile or their assessment, but I do get at it using the same general language, talking to them in the same language that we are using, and it pricks something with them. Uh, just the other day, in fact, I was with one of our staff people uh, in a quick little meeting, and it was, a, like you say, Neil, a very short meeting, but just, um, just helping him to realize, hey, yeah, I am under a lot of stress, and one of the reasons is because I need structure, and my structures all around me right now are falling apart. And mm -hmm. so one of the things I was able to coach him through briefly in an informal coaching session was just to say, so what do you need to do to try and establish some kind of order in your life right now? When things are changing, at that point, they were still changing almost hourly, um, but they were certainly changing daily to say, what are some things that you can do to build structure into your life in spite of the fact that all around you there is still chaos and disorder and uncertainty? One of those things was, he said, you know, I can still get up in the morning and I can still have my devotional time. I can still get dressed as if I'm going to the office. In fact, 
uh, I often encourage people, uh, hey, get up at a regular time, get into your office, even if your office is just going to be an easy chair in your living room for right now, get dressed and say, okay, I am in the office now. If you still have work, things that you should be doing. And if you're out of work, well, get dressed as if you were going to an interview. And if you're out of work right now, your full-time job ought to be trying to find work. So what are you doing to, to get some structure in your life to do that? You can't go to Starbucks right now and just sit in the cafe. <laughs> so instead of that, what are you going to do proactively to get control over the things that you can get control over? Mm -hmm. And then let's recognize also, what are the things that you can't have control over? There is no point in stressing over those things if you don't have control over them and you can't get control. So let's concentrate on the things you can get control over. Mm -hmm. That was about a 10 minute, 15 minute conversation. And you know, he comes away saying, hey, you know, there are some things I can do. And he starts spouting off all of these ideas. And the next thing you know, um, he's got his life pretty much back in order. Mm -hmm. Someone else. Larry, I'd like to just bring up one other thing that you talked about, and that is uh, with stressors. I, I think sometimes uh, this is also an opportunity for us to be vulnerable as leaders around the stressors that we experience and how the, uh, uh, the assessments have helped us to uh, be uh, both aware and uh, of uh, issues in our own life. And uh, that vulnerability, uh, just builds the relationship that uh, becomes a foundation for uh, you know training that happens later on. Wow, that is yeah, that that is so true, Neil. Um, right now, more than ever, is an opportunity for leaders to to demonstrate their own vulnerability, transparency with their teams. When they're having to learn how to meet, for example, in this medium of Zoom, uh, which has skyrocketed, you know, everybody, uh, it, someone did mention, okay, we're Zoom fatigued right now. Uh, <laughs> yes, I understand that. We are. Um, we get screen fatigue, and we're, we're kind of tired of just looking at, you know, the, the, the digital representations of people. We'd like to have a little bit more personal human contact. And to be real honest, some of us might like to have a little bit more alone time. We're having so many meetings that we feel like we're really not having our quiet time alone time by myself because I'm going from meeting to meeting in this medium. If we can help leaders to understand, you need to have two-way communication with every, of every one of the people that you work directly with. Uh, you don't need to use this platform for one-way communication because one-way communication is not communication. It's communication mm -hmm. without the code. And so we need to help leaders to understand, here's an opportunity for you to get personal, for you to share even your own struggles, to allow those people you work with to share their struggles. And um, I, I, I don't know if any of you were with, uh, Pat Lancioni yesterday, or in the last few weeks, as he's been having some webinars, uh, presenting things, uh, some free tools that he's making available. One of the things that he said to consultants and coaches was, uh, you know, we need to remember that healthy organizations are able to have healthy conflict. Mm -hmm. In this medium, can we actually encourage disagreement and conflict for people to express themselves and then get to the other side of that. You can't do that if you're only in listen mode and the other end is doing all the talking. It must become dialogue. And I know that some of you have some thoughts on that. Um, are we able to help teams, groups of people come to the point where they can be vulnerable enough and feel enough trust with each other, the people that they are working with, to actually be able to share, you know, 
I've got some problems with this and get into some good, healthy conflict, but then be able to come across to the other side of that with some healthy solutions as well. Does that uh, ring anybody's bell? Does that bring any thought to mind? Steve Busevsky, I'm going to jump on you because I saw your head going up and down with that. And, uh, as a yeah. project manager, type well, person, I know you've led people through conflict. Yeah, I have. But uh, I guess the big point here is, um, you know, this is a new environment that most of us have to live through. Yeah. Uh, where most, you know, most times we have to deal with people one on one face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the new reality for a lot of people. That, uh, it's in a virtual environment. So I think your point of, you know, maybe we're going to have to learn some new tools on how to do conflict virtually. And uh, I think that is something that, um, you know, as coaches, as leaders, we're gonna have to learn how to do that in a constructive manner. And we don't really think about that as being healthy sometimes, do we? No. But it is, it, it is healthy because um, if we hold our disagreements inside and allow them to fester inside us, they become cancerous. Mm -hmm. And so when we have disagreements, it's only through the building of trust that we can share those disagreements with any kind of confidence and then get to the other side of it. And I would love for somebody to, um, not just because I love a fight, but I mean, I would love for somebody to get into uh, even a discussion about that. Wait a minute. Uh, is that true? So again, Matthew? I think it's hard. I, I think that is really a, a nice idea. I think it's really hard in a virtual setting to invite people into dealing with conflict because we, we not only are we separated physically but this gives us an easy out to avoid people and conflict and and to not deal with it um and when people are stressed so maybe i'm doing fine but the people i'm talking to are stressed or maybe it's the other way around maybe maybe they're doing fine and i'm the one and i'm in a stress behavior and i, I just think i think it's a great goal i think it's really tough and when people have a lot of other things they're they're uh, facing off with unless someone really likes conflict it's going to be hard to invite them into uh, dealing with things constructively in that uh, there's just so much that we cannot do well we're not designed for it maybe we're still learning but we're right now we're not designed to handle everything virtually uh, all I see is, is, you know, your head and I can read a little bit of facial expressions. There's a whole lot about the atmosphere and body language. I can't read that. Uh, I'm limited. And mm -hmm. so I'm making now judgments and interaction of very limited information, much, much less than if I was sitting in a room with you. I think that's tough. And to invite people to dive deeper into a volatile area I think we just have to be wise, not that we want to avoid it, but we just have to be wise because it could be a lot of uh, hurt and then we just get off the Zoom and I'm not talking to them. I, I just got to carry that with me when I leave then this meeting mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm walking into the next room where I've got my kids or my family. So I don't want to, I'm, I'm with you. I don't think we need to avoid it. It's something we're going to have to work on, but I, it's not an easy one uh, just because we approach it. Excellent point. Excellent point, Matthew. And of course, you know, what, uh, what Lencioni would say and others, and I, I definitely agree with this, is you can't have that healthy conflict if you haven't built trust in the relationship. And so mm. what can we do to help leaders right now concentrate on that relationship building and, uh, and not just, well, for example, I'm thinking right now of a church that has been asked to um, make some, some recommendations about what do we do when we start gathering back together. Uh, and 
the uh, governmental leaders, the local government has come to this church and said, hey, you're a leader in our community. We want you to talk, uh, we, we want you to make some suggestions about what, what, what will be our next steps. Now, as that staff gets together, if, if this pastor has not built good relationships with them, they're going to just acquiesce to every idea that he comes up with, whether they think it's a good idea or not. But right now, more than ever, they need to be able to express themselves. And they need to be able to say if they have a disagreement with something that he or, or anyone else might be suggesting. Because they're going to come up with some ideas that are not workable. And they've got to be able to work through those ideas to get to the ones that are workable. They need to show respect to each other. And as one person presents an idea, if they're not careful, there'll be the private chat going on over here. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of, but they won't say mm -hmm. it out loud to the person. Mm -hmm. And so if they're not working first, if that pastor doesn't work first on helping to build those trust relationships with those people mm -hmm. before they dive into this kind of a subject, then they're going to go down some, some, some really rough road. Mm -hmm. Albert, I think I saw some, uh, some, some nodding of head there. Yes, I think that it's just applied to me. And uh, I, I became the senior pastor of this church in 2018. And basically for the past uh, like eight years before I come in, uh, there's a lot of turmoil within the church. Uh, senior pastor, uh, like the founder of this church has uh, resigned. And uh, before that, uh, English, one of the English pastor has uh, as a uh, get a group of people and then leaving the church, which create a whole of this church, which is from in the English congregation from 40 to 50, this is totally empty. And the pastor is just in and out, in and out, both in the English and the Mandarin congregations. And without the senior pastor for like good, like six, seven years, uh, the pastor basically is focused on doing their own stuff, uh, very subtle, uh, on the, uh, and the department that they are, they are focused on. And uh, so somehow through this whole process, a lot of uh, a lot of some of the elders just coming in uh, to try to be the leader at the same time is not not like try to be leading but not leading the proper way. So when I first come in, there's a lot of dynamic. Uh, dynamic is basically the, the the trust and the team spirit of the whole pastoral team. One thing, and another is about the trust level between the pastoral team and also the elder board. Uh, so I come in uh, like. Right now, it's probably close to a year and a half, close to two years. I, I think that it's like, before we can go to a team building, I think that the individual time spent with them to build the trust level is very important. And every person is unique. I think that a couple of months ago, we've gone through a team building uh, with uh, Tracy in the, in the Mississauga area. Uh, it's a team building. So everyone has a this, the different character. Their value system is different. So, uh, uh, what we found that one of the past is basically the value system is about how people treasure his opinion. So, uh, if you let open, not we do have a trust level. We open the thing of discussion. We we're just feeling against this idea that probably we get in big trouble. So I think that 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 individual work needs to be done before we go into team, especially in the, in the in the conflict resolutions. I think it's keep on reminding them uh, what happened in the past is the past. And also need to you need to invite God into the whole process too for that kind of forgiveness and resolving all those conflicts. It's, it's, it's a process. Still up to this point, sometimes the the pastor is still still very uh, very like hands fist up if there's something that is coming out from the elder board. So is it keep reminding them how come you react that way? Just point out, okay, is it because of this? So I think keep on pointing and pointing and pointing until they can overcome it. I think I think. As the lead pastor in this church, St. Pastor is the vulnerability, you need to be there. You need to open up yourself. You need to open your heart. You need to allow them to see, okay, I, I gone through that same thing again. So, and uh, it, it's, it's a totally like different process. I, and I don't think uh, the online platform can serve any kind of conflict resolution at all because it takes longer. It is very subtle. You need to feel that there, gesture, the eye contact, even the, the way that they sit, how they, how they, how they put their hands, it's all the things will come in the picture to know whether they are, they are fit in the picture or not. So, uh, but I think that it's like for us, 
at that time we do a face-to-face -face team building. I think it works very good uh, because we have, we have we have spent a year and a half to rebuilding the team already. Um, no, honestly, uh, I, I want to listen to learn. It's like how to do like a team building, especially so conflict resolution through the online platform. I, I, I'm still skeptical. I doesn't mean I, I don't believe it, but I just don't know how to handle it properly. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Someone else want to respond to that before I do? Let me let me say that. Um, uh, let's see. Week before last, actually, our um, in, we, uh, in the Baptist church that I am in, we have a deacon board. Um, and um, the pastors would be functioning more as elders, but the, uh, the, the, the deacons, about 52 of them, gathered in a meeting for the first time in a virtual meeting by Zoom. Uh, their chairman led, uh, did an excellent job of leading them. They had their um, agenda, just like they would have if they'd been meeting in the same room, shared the agenda out with everyone in a PDF format, flashed the agenda up on the screen, and they um, went through the agenda, had particular committees that were making reports, what they'd been doing. Uh, they even heard a report, uh, we are in the process of a pastor search right now. Um, our pastor is about to retire, and he was going to retire in June. Our pastor search committee is actively searching for his successor. Uh, they gave a report of what they're doing and how they are meeting and even some interviews that they have had even at this time. Um, and um, they had some prayer requests and they went through um, a number of things. It, with 52 people in a Zoom room, you can imagine not everyone got to speak who might have wanted to, but in some ways they said it went better than it did when they had a a meeting in the room because they could enter into the chat over here any of their questions or their concerns. And so um, what they discovered was more people could raise questions that way than would have if they were doing it live. I can see that a number of you have typed in this. You know, he said, um, I see several of you have typed about this. Um, let's see uh, if this answers those questions. And in some ways, um, that might be, Bruce, what you were saying. They might have felt that they could be a little bit more vulnerable. By, some people might have felt that they could be a little bit more vulnerable by typing in that um, uh, response that way than they would have if they'd had to speak up and raise their hand in a meeting. Um, Bruce, you, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, I think I, I was, I, I'm on an online platform every week in this kind of an environment and uh, it, it's a pretty engaging environment, but there are opportunities where you can only one person can share at a time. So it does limit a little bit of discussion and limits uh, opportunity for uh, feedback and so on. So, but I think at the same time, it also gives the people that anonymity a little bit, even as Albert talked about people um, are afraid to, you can't really read what's going on, but at the same time, you can also uh, pull out of the room and just turn your uh, turn your video off. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's a much better picture anyway. <laughs> much better. Yeah, my wife definitely looks better than I do. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, and that that does raise another uh, issue because. Uh, Matt, as you were talking about also, not being able to get all of the body language, and especially if they are putting an avatar up instead of their own picture, if they are um, not sharing their video, or if they, you know, they, they click off, they cancel the video for a moment so that they can step away, uh, and you don't know mm -hmm. why they're stepping away, are they, you know, are they totally disengaging from the meeting when they're muting? Are they carrying on another sideline conversation or whatever? I've heard some people say that in small group meetings, you ought to go ahead and leave all the microphones open, even with the barking dogs and the children coming in and interrupting, that you ought to leave all the mics open because that lets us be real about who we are and where we are and <laughs> helps to keep us more engaged if we know that our microphones are not muted. Um, I don't know about that because sometimes 
the feedback gets bad and you just have to mute someone's microphone or it's going to make it uh, you know, untenable for everybody else. I, I do know that what you want to do is make this just as real as you possibly can of keeping in mind that we are building relationships with real people on the other side of every one of these cameras, every one of these microphones. And as we are helping them to discover what are their strengths, what are their gifts, and how do they need to be more creative in mobilizing those gifts, finding ways to reach out beyond their past comfort zones um, to find what is the new ministry that they, that the Lord mm -hmm. has been I think I think for me that's one thing that's really interesting is like we we we're quite easy to act to have a like a assertiveness. We we always as a pastor as a leader we we are trained to talk a lot, even more than more than I want. But at the same time, I think that uh, using the online platform, the hardest way is how to listen carefully. Uh, so I think that in our English ministry, they set up a ground rule. You go through the either the Zoom or the online meeting. Uh, you need. A uh, you cannot you cannot say anything, uh, not until the 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 host call your name to allow you to speak. So you need to one at a time because uh, in if we for conflict resolutions, if, if we can do it in, in a room setting, uh, one one people share about his or her feeling, people will jump into say that no, you cannot think like, like we will jump into like we always like to be a problem solver. So we just will always jump in before a chance for the people to have chance to say whatever um, he or she want to say. So we, we set a ground rule is you need to raise your hand before you say anything and you need to wait until others finish saying before you can jump in. So I think that's kind of some, some kind of ground rule need to be set up for that type of team if we want to conflict resolution. If not, it will become a, a big market which is people just keep on shouting and keep on saying what they want to say and without any kind of constructive uh, resolution and come off it. Yeah, that's another good point. A very, very good point, Albert. Um, you know, establishing our etiquette of how we want to behave when we are in meetings together, uh, respecting time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're using the free Zoom, that's going to help you because the 40 minutes runs out and the meeting ends, and that can be um, a, a helper to say we're going to keep short meetings and be respectful of people's time. Mm -hmm. um, and providing some means of, you know, um, all right, the meeting's over, and what if I'm feeling frustrated because I don't feel like we really finished the subject? Then how do we, how do, we do follow up with that as well? But I, I do think we have to keep coming back to the thing of mm -hmm. the importance of the personal relationships that are that are one on one and not just in the group. If we don't build those, then we're going to miss the opportunity to build real unity in the body. Uh, it is an interdependency of individuals, each of whom contributes to make the body. Someone asked also, Neil, you, uh, you were talking about using the breakout rooms to have more vulnerable conversation. Um, one of the things we're doing, for example, in our, in our church, we are a very large church, uh, First Baptist Church, Montgomery. Alabama. Uh, on Wednesday evenings, we have our regular prayer time, and for the last four weeks, we've been meeting by Zoom. Um, from the very first, when our governor gave the order that we could not have large meetings, immediately we set up a Zoom meeting for our first prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we do this um, every Wednesday night. We have a, about a 45-minute prayer session, and we send out the information, by the way, for, for privacy purposes, and we did get Zoom bombed once. Uh, we always have someone who is the host who is monitoring it. Uh, usually we have two or three hosts, uh, co-hosts, so uh, they can be watching for things. If someone comes on that we don't recognize, if they log on without their name, you know, you have the opportunity to change your name on Zoom. If someone logs on without their name, we specifically ask them, hey, who is this? Uh, please identify yourself so that we can be sure that it's not someone who's invading. 
We love to have people come in from the outside. And the first couple of weeks, we were able to do that. But when we got Zoom bombed, um, and someone tried to share a screen with uh, a lady who was taking her clothes off, uh, and that wasn't exactly what we wanted going out on our prayer time, especially since we all also um, connect this to Facebook. We go Facebook Live with it. Also. Oh. So it's out there. We decided, okay, anybody who wants to join us that is not uh, a member of the church or connected to the church to get the password, we do have it password protected now. Mm -hmm. They can always go on Zoom and they can watch and they can participate that way. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the session, the last 15 minutes, we do break into rooms with groups of three or four and mm -hmm. we ask them to stay in their room and share personal prayer requests with mm -hmm. each other and pray for each other. And we leave the room open as long as they want to stay. Uh, okay. We don't ask them to come back to the large meet to the large room. You can do oh. that out of your um, Zoom meetings. You can also set the Zoom room up for a specific time in which you tell people uh, they're going to be coming back here for a debrief or whatever to the large room. We mm. decided it was best not to do that. Let mm. them have their personal small group time and then go from there uh, and dismiss themselves. And our host monitor stays in the large room because uh, people who are calling in by phone don't get into those small rooms sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, or some people elect not to go to their small group for whatever reason. They may not mm -hmm. feel comfortable in small group prayer. So we let them stay in the large room and then we share a few more prayer requests with them and pray for them and, and dismiss from mm -hmm. there. Or we just have yeah. conversation going. And by the way, mm -hmm. we are in a live meeting. If they want to come back to the large meeting, and they want to say, hey, by the way, and they're talking to someone, we allow them to do that. They can even get off in another private room if they wanted to, but we have not been facilitating that. We've just been saying, hey, get a phone number, call them on the phone, uh, and go from there. Mm -hmm. So we're using the small room, the, the room feature on Zoom. Uh, that is paid Zoom. You need to have the paid version to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it is well worth it. Uh, we're having um, a couple of hundred people that are joining us by Facebook every week and are just sitting into our prayer time. Former members who live in other parts of the world are dialing in. They want to be a part of it also. They're doing mm -hmm. it. Um, and by the way, we do the same thing. Uh, my own Bible study fellowship, uh, we are doing that on Sunday mornings as we have our Bible study time with our teacher. And on Thursday nights, once every two weeks, we have a class social by Zoom. And our class social, we get together and we do small group uh, rooms also at the end of that. We have a little bit of a format. Tonight, for example, we're going to just say, hey, what are you doing to find routine in your life? How, what, what are some ways that you have established uh, routine? Mm -hmm. How uh, do you see God at work? Where do you see God at work right now? Uh, share a funny story if you want to. We, we like to laugh in our class, so people hmm. share a funny story. And then uh, what are some prayer requests that you want to share with the group or some praise items that we can share with the group? And then we go into our small group, uh, uh, into the room features. Uh, we use them, uh, we, we keep the rooms to three or four because hmm. many times there are couples that are together on the same call and we don't want it to get to be too large of a group, so three to four people that will be assigned mm -hmm. in each room. Yes. And that uh, has done very, very well. Uh, mm -hmm. I have responded to it just tremendously. Strongly recommend that you can do that. Also, even with, uh, if, especially if you're working with a larger team, and let's say they are wanting to get into some breakout discussions, let's say right now they're talking about what is our plan going to be when we go back to, um, meeting uh, and are we going to start meeting in small groups are we going to put in multiple worship services so they can still keep their social distance some people are not going to want to sit close together mm -hmm. uh, some people are not going to want to put their children in close proximity with other children by the way are we going to have vacation bible school this summer or not are we going to have youth camp or not there are all these things to be discussed Mm -hmm. So our teams, uh, the, the larger group of people that might be talking about this, let's separate them out into to, to rooms, into Zoom rooms, have their discussion, then come back together in the large group. All right, let's report back. Another way you can do that, of course, 
is to say, you guys get together in your own little conference call, and we'll have set another meeting to come back and report to the large group. You, as a coach, can help them with some of these ideas to say, here are some things that we can do, guys, to keep our unity, to build it. You can help them to recognize what some of those stressors are that are affecting them right now, mm-hmm. and um, how we can help one another to listen more closely to each other, to come to the conclusions that God is leading us to. And um, I think that's a, it's a great way for you to gently offer your services without waiting for them to come and say, could you help us? This is a Mm -hmm. time for us to lean in with suggestions. And they may not want to take all of those suggestions that you might make, but some simple, simple solutions that you could offer them that are coming Mm. out of what we are learning about how we're working together as a team. And I've talked way more than I really wanted to today. John, I see you've been grinning a lot. Uh, Can I (laughs) call you to just share a little bit about some of your thoughts right now? You're gonna have to unmute yourself first though. There you go. No, I see you're not, you're still muted. Now you are. So I think it depends on the health of your body you're working with. Um, I, uh, I perceive that the group I'm working with is actually pretty healthy right now. They're mm-hmm. holding good meetings online. They are using Zoom extensively. I think um, it, it just I think there's an unevenness in where people are and their use of technology, and it just depends. So I guess I, I think I think what we're what we're onto is is how do we use Zoom as a tool and help people use it in smarter ways? And then as that foundation comes on board, we can learn from each other on some of the issues that we're kind of wondering about, whether it be dealing with conflict or team um, building. So I think we continue the, um, just, I like where this is going in terms of how we're learning from one another. I just think it's, I think it's still in the middle of that. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying, I'm just sitting there listening, thinking about, wow, I think we're doing everything okay. They don't, they're, you know, I'm, I'm kind of connected to hearing what they're doing and they're, they're healthy. I mean, they're, they're doing okay. Yeah. Talk to us about some of the things that they are doing, John. Um, so, um, very active Zoom. I mean, almost a lot. I mean, lots of Zoom interactions. Um, they are, they are, um, at the, you know, I was listening earlier, you have to decide what you can still do face-to-face and what you can do virtually. And I think they're navigating that well, where there are some face-to-face environment meetings, you know, picking large rooms, six feet apart, you can still have meetings with people. Uh, and, and so these are, and it also depends on what the requirements are in your area, right? Certain areas are locked down more than others. Most of them do um, and I think that that's healthy. I think, uh, my other thought is, is um, the question is, was, was the team as a foundation healthy going into this? Yeah. And I think this one was, you know, in, in some respects, I'm not going to get into details, but they're on, they were on, they're on a journey and some of the, um, I'll say this, I'll, I'll use my, uh, some of the people that would have been disruptive and not as well adapted to this are no longer with the team. <laughs> it's been a little pruning. And I think then the attitudes of the people who are remaining are in a different place. Yeah. So and that's prior to all this stuff playing out. So that's just my personal experience and what I'm seeing. Um, it doesn't prevent us from asking permission. What I was thinking about was it seemed like Larry, you had the you had you're in your role, you're more in the middle, and where I'm on the side, and what I'm thinking about, maybe I need to ask permission to be in a Zoom meeting so I can observe as an outsider a bit what's going on to provide maybe some recommendation on things that can find you. Yeah, and just to clarify, John, if I am in the middle, it's because I offered to be. It's not because positionally I was. I see it. I'm saying that. I'm saying that's my that's my observation. That's the opportunity is to say, could I could I be an observer? 
maybe that's our next step is could I be an observer of just sit on the sides and be able to ask permission to listen in and maybe I can help you in some things that you're not seeing but maybe I can see. Yeah, good point. In fact, with that deacons meeting, see, I'm not a me deacon, but I was asked to attend the deacons meeting primarily because they knew that I've been using Zoom uh, for quite some time. So would I sit in on the meeting and then afterwards could I offer some, some suggestions about how to help the next meeting to go better? So, uh, and that was because I offered, I, you know, from the very beginning when we started going lockdown, I said, hey, I've been using Zoom a lot. And, and it's, you know, it could be any other platform, but this is just the one that I'm most familiar with and like. I said, I've been using it a lot. I'll be happy to help anybody that wants to set up a Zoom meeting. Just give me a call. That's what I can, this is the ministry I can offer to the church right now. And in the process of doing that, when a team leader or a class a, a teacher or anyone else came and said, yeah, could you help us with this? Well, in the process of doing that, I'm able to also offer some other observations because I have earned their trust when I sit silently in the meeting and I'm just facilitating the meeting and I'm only talking to the leader after the meeting is over. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think you're right there. There are some things that we can offer for them. Um, and, um, but it is a matter of our offering ourselves. I think that's the important thing. And even, um, in your case, Albert, where you are, say, the, the senior pastor, um, uh, just being aware, I would say in your case, be aware that you really do need to help have someone else to help you to moderate the platform, the medium that you're using. If you're using Zoom, for example, it is far better for you to have someone else who is helping to monitor the chat, who's coming in and out of the participation, um, and to be um, uh, helping to to run the technical side of things than to be running it all by yourself. Um, it's always best to have someone else helping you with that. Yeah. I'm sorry, Albert, I think you're muted again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think for my church, if you're running of, the, of a bigger group, we always have the host. We also have two to three co-hosts. Like it will keep track, like the the uh, the waiting room. They can doing the sign in, uh, mute them, or uh, take care of like if their screen is not on, the name is not correct. So there's a couple of co-hosts in the group. Let's say we have a our we have a couple of uh, group that doing using the Zoom to do the prayer meeting. We go to a separate group. So there's a co-host which, which will assign room. will do the sign in from the waiting room or things like that. So. Uh, the pastor will, some of the, one of the pastors will just keep on doing the host and then the rest will be helping out to make sure all the, even the presentation, make sure the presentation is on the computer so they make sure the presentation will be as good to go. Right. Instead, of instead of finding that, that video when the time is there. That's right. Yeah, in fact, uh, even today, um, we were supposed to have had, uh, today, um, Ken, Demar was supposed to be co-hosting this, uh, this panel. And at the last minute, he discovered that he had a meeting that, another meeting that superseded this one. He had to be there at the other meeting. So, okay, I'm gonna run this one by myself. But there was an advantage. We had one or the other of us was going to be here for sure for this meeting. There's an advantage to having that, especially right now also, to have a backup. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we're, we're, we're like a church that I, we, we helped to start in Mexico. Um, inside a prison, inside the prison walls. We established a church. They had three pastors and they wanted to always have three pastors. They were co-pastors, not one senior and the others uh, associates to him, but they were three co-pastors. And they said, we always need to have three because we never know when one of us might be transferred or released. So we will always have three <laughs> be prepared for any contingency that way. Okay. So I feel like that's kind of a, a good, a good um, okay example for us to follow yes well with that folks i know we've already had some people that have had to sign off we're going to try and be respectful of your time i don't know if this has been of any help to you but it has helped to remind me of how we need to just keep pushing forward we don't need to sit back we need to lean forward into this situation we need to be the leaders in it we need to be helping each other we need to be 
proactive in helping the church to be the church. I love what my friend Sergio Vargas said in Mexico City last week. Um, he said that the, the doors of the temple are closed, but the church is wide open for ministry. Amen. And so as we learn to be the scattered church at work, being the church in our community, building the unity, but for the purpose of bringing fruit to the Father so he can be glorified. So I pray that you will just keep doing everything you can to help build that unity. And uh, if we can be of any service to you here at Grip Park, then just contact us and we'll try to help you anywhere we can. The Lord bless you all. Bye-bye.